Welcome back to Yu-Gi-Oh! History with Joe Giorlando. In today's video, we are going to the summer of 2013 for the very first time and profiling one of the most unique formats in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history. I'm talking about Spellbook versus Dragon Ruler format. Before we get into the actual introduction of this Spellbook deck, I do have a couple shoutouts to give. First, the in real life team that I joined, JNC, I'll link their YouTube below. And in addition to that, I also want to give a shout out to TCG Rewind. I've actually been playing some games with 2011 format, kind of actually doing this big tournament of decks from that format. I'm talking about Tangu plant format. So if you've been curious about you know, where my dual videos have been, I've actually been playing over there recently. So you can check out their YouTube as well. I'll put the link in the description. Now that that's out of the way, what are we doing today? So we're going to look at what I think is the most unique formats in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, because up to 2013, I think this is by far the most powerful deck ever, at least the most powerful collection of decks ever. Frog FTK was powerful in its own right. Plants were powerful in their own right. Dino Rabbit, Wind Up Loop, hitting all the cards out of the hand with Hunter. Like these decks were powerful in their own right, Infernity certainly. But there was no deck that generated this overwhelming degree of card advantage. Like, yeah, Frog FTK reduce your life points to zero, and it's powerful in its own right as an FTK deck. But Spellbook of Judgment and the Super Rejuvenation plus the Baby Rulers did things that had never been seen before in Yu-Gi-Oh! You used to have to work really hard to get a plus one in some formats, right? You get to flip your Dekoichi tribute for the Stalos and you think you were on top of the world. Well, all of a sudden now we had cards like Spellbook of Judgment that you would activate and it would legitimately net you three, four, five, six cards and then basically let you do it all again the next turn and every turn for the rest of the game as a matter of fact. And it made cards like Bottomless Trap Hole totally irrelevant, right? You can't Bottomless Trap Hole a Spellbook player and actually think that you're going to get anywhere because your opponent just has infinite cards. It made cards like bottomless trap hole even to a degree cards like solemn morning although it's actually in my deck it made those just generic back and forth one for one cards more or less unplayable because your opponent can just generate so much card advantage through a spell book of judgment or through just the iteration of combos that the dragon deck could do with or without super rejuvenation quite frankly and it made it so that you basically needed to play one of those two powerful decks because they generated card advantage at a rate that was just unfounded up to that point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history and it wasn't until many years later with some other formats maybe Necroz, certainly maybe what the Pendulum decks could do when they first started to get popular, where you would actually see Yu-Gi-Oh! to that level. But quite frankly, I think if you look at 2013, it's such a unique moment in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history because the year prior in 2012, we're fighting with Windups and Macro Rabbit and Dino Rabbit iterations and Insectors, Chaos Rulers, or Chaos Dragons at Nationals. And then the year after, of course, we have Soul Charge hat format. 2013, though, just kind of jumps out, particularly that summer format where all of a sudden we were playing Spellbook of Judgment and Super Rejuvenation and generating more card advantage that had ever been seen in Yu-Gi-Oh's history up to that point. Those cards would eventually get banned and things would kind of calm down going forward. But in this short period of time, we saw these two decks combat one another with Evil Swarms as a, what I think, pretty distant tier, maybe two or three deck off to the side. But these two unbelievably powerful decks can beat with one another. And for those people that like those really narrow formats, this was it. My Nationals that year was actually pretty simple. I remember I played, I ended up losing the last round of day one. I think I played something like nine rounds. Pretty simple. I played six Dragon Ruler decks, two Mirror Matches, I played Spellbooks, and then one Evil Swarm deck. And that was basically what you would anticipate. You'd play about 50% Dragon Ruler, 50% Spellbooks. Maybe you'd play one Rogue deck throughout Swiss, maybe two. And even the list of potential Rogue decks was basically just Evil Swarms. Maybe 2-3% of the field will play something like Mermails, but the deck wasn't even that good. And as a result, you wouldn't even have to worry about it. You would just focus all of your attention. You'd have main deck slots for things. You would devote all of your attention and your testing. Can I master the Mirror Match if you're playing Spellbook? Or master the Dragon Ruler Mirror Match if you're playing that? And can I fight against the other deck? And then do I have some plan for Evil Swarms? Maybe I'll play against one of them. And that's really all that Nationals, and even Worlds that year, quite frankly, was. A very, very narrow format where there were just a couple decks. What makes this kind of interesting is that when I eventually profile Dragon Ruler, I could probably just profile one and that be it. One Dragon Ruler deck for the most part encapsulates what a lot of the decks look like. Spellbook's a little bit different. There's a High Priestess version, like the one I ran at Nationals, the one that we're profiling today. There's versions without it. There's versions with Magical Mallet of all cards. There's versions with the Star Hall. There's versions without it. There's sort of three or four different popular versions of Spellbook. So I'll probably end up having to profile a couple over the course of the channel's history. But today we're going to profile as close to the Nationals deck as I can remember, right? I don't have it written down anywhere. I don't have any pictures of it. This is all from memory. I would probably wager to bet that this deck is about two or three cards off what I played at Nationals, at least in the main deck. And the theme of the side deck is the same too. I don't remember every precise card, but it's the theme of the side deck. I remember probably 10 cards that I sided, but it's what I ended up playing at the 2013 Nationals. I ended up losing at the last round of day one to actually Jesse Cotton in a mirror match. 
but it's a pretty fun national. I really like my deck, quite frankly. Kind of one of those events where, on paper, I thought my deck was like unbelievable, but it didn't end up translating as well. I lost both of the mirror matches I played, even though, as you're going to see, I main deck some pretty intense cards for the mirror match. It just didn't end up working out. Without further ado, let's take our first deep dive look at the 2013 national season, our very first deep dive look at spellbooks, and specifically look at a high priestess version of spellbooks. All right, we'll start with the monster lineup. First, we have three spellbook magician of prophecy obviously self-explanatory for the other cards that were basically staples a quantity of kaiku the ghost destroyers i elected only to play two kaikus in this deck because there are other targets for spellbook of judgment during the end phase for those that didn't play this format kaiku is just an absolute powerhouse against the two most popular decks in the mirror match it shut off spellbook of fate which is quite frankly the best non-spellbook of judgment spellbook right in theory this is a deck and this is a saying that an old friend of mine had. It's a deck that rotas for rota for rota. Well, Spellbook of Fate is the card that kind of breaks that mold, right? If your deck's just all rotoring for rota and drawing rotas to rota for rota, which is what a lot of this deck is doing, Spellbook of Fate is a card that changes all that because it's actual removal and a little bit of other utility too with its other effects. Well, Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer will shut off your opponent's Spellbook of Fate, so it's a really fantastic card. It's also obviously just fantastic against Dragon Rulers, right? If, let's say, 40% of the field is Dragon Rulers with babies, you definitely want a card like Kaiku because it can shut off the recursion of the Dragon Rulers, or honestly, even the summon of the Dragon Rulers because you can't banish from the graveyard. So Kaiku, absolutely fantastic card. It can also shut down Priestess to an extent. You can actually banish cards from your hand for Priestess's effect. So if your opponent is playing the Priestess version in the mirror match, there are ways around it, but it is just something to note that whether it's Spellbook of Fate or Dragon Rule, it's just an absolutely critical card in this particular deck. It's one of the reasons, honestly, to play this deck. I remember I played High Priestess at National, so I'm going to put down a couple copies. Some versions of Priestess Prophecy decks only played one. It's actually fairly easy to tutor, and I'll talk about that in a second. I put two here because I'm pretty sure I ran two at National, so I've elected to build a version that's as reminiscent of my Nationals deck as possible. So two High Priestess. I think it was just one of those cards that can deal damage relatively quickly. This deck can sometimes have a difficult time dealing damage if it doesn't have Spellbook star hall going with a lot of counters on it and the ability to get a 2500 body special summon it maybe use a spell book of power or even a master all of a sudden you can do 4000 plus damage you can win quicker with a much much more ease because of prophecy it could contribute to brick hands though it's not necessarily the greatest card in the world if you draw it obviously you can special summon it pretty easily but that's not necessarily what this deck is trying to do to win it doesn't really contribute to the big spell book of judgment play so i can understand not playing this version and running less monsters and earing towards just more spells to enable you to get to spell book of judgment you know i'm going to talk eventually about the magical mallet versions of this deck and some of the other iterations but i remember i played this in national so i will include it and then some of the utility cards off spell book of judgment so typically during the end phase you're either going to search kaiku that's an obvious one the other just completely obvious one that every version of this deck played was Jaugen. Jaugen enables you to special summon a monster that locks your opponent out of special summoning, and if obviously your opponent doesn't have an out, that can be very difficult. And this deck, in its Spellbook of Judgment play, typically ends up searching so much, it can end up searching cards like Spellbook of Wisdom, Spellbook of Fate, a bunch of protection cards, and just in the iteration of searching, if you get a Spellbook of Wisdom, or you already have Spellbook of Wisdom, that can protect your Jaugen from cards like Last Day of the Witch in the post-side games, or even things like, let's say, Book of Moon in the, or Wing Glass, for example, in game one. So, fantastic card. You can usually protect it relatively well. If you have Star, Star Hall out there with a bunch of counters, you can even willingly put it into attack mode, and its attack could actually be way higher than you anticipate. So, Jaugen is just the obvious inclusion. This deck's, honestly, win condition is to spell Book Adjustment for a ton, get that Jaugen out, stun the opponent for a turn, and then resolve that second spell Book Adjustment, which is usually the backbreaker. So one copy of Jaugen. Some versions even actually played more than one, but this is a, in many ways a protect Jaugen deck or protect Kaiku deck, or honestly protect both of them. I have one copy of Justice of Prophecy. What Justice of Prophecy does is it gives you sort of a third monster you can summon during the end phase with Spellbook of Judgment. And then during the end phase, you can summon this and then banish it during the end phase and then search a Priestess and then another Spellbook. Oftentimes you actually just search Spellbook of Judgment off of this in the end phase. Uh, technically to Spellbook of Judgment on the following turn, you end up searching Secrets, and then the Secrets gets the ball rolling again. This actually can just shortcut right to Judgment and then enable an even bigger Judgment on the second turn. A little bit win more, quite frankly. You don't really ever need to do that, but it is an option. And it is one of the ways of tutoring out the Prophecy, right? The High Prophecy doesn't actually have the word Spellbook in its name, so it can't just be tutored through Secrets. But because you're using Spellbook of Judgment so regularly in this deck, the Justice of Prophecy will tutor the High Priestess, and then that basically enables you to search it whenever you need. 
So that is my monster lineup so far. The other cool one, and this wasn't staple, but it was a card I absolutely remember playing at Nationals. It's a really cool card. It's, it's Defender. So what Defender does is when it's summoned, it gets a counter, kind of like Breaker the Magical Warrior, right? It's kind of similar iteration type card. And what it basically does is once per turn, if Spellcaster or Spellcasters will be destroyed, that's by battle or by card effect, you can remove a counter from the field instead. Uh, technically, you can remove the counter from itself, but typically you want to use counters on things like the Spell Hall, right? If you have Spell Hall going, or rather Star Hall, it can be really difficult to actually break through your, your board, right? Because you have... Wisdom, which protects a spellcaster from a spell or trap card, right? So that can protect you against some destruction. You have Solemn Judgment in your deck. You have even other counter traps, which I'll talk about in the profile. But now you actually also have this, which can be really difficult because if you thought you could just attack over a Jaugen, this is one of the best ways of making it so your opponent can't even attack over Jaugen because you have Jaugen on the field. Now you have this. Your opponent basically needs to deal with this first entirely and then deal with the Jaugen. That can just be really difficult to do. So it can make an additional layer of protection, right? As I mentioned a moment ago, Jaugen is... Basically, this deck's underlying win condition after Spellbook of Judgment, and you want to protect it at all costs, and this is one of the ways of doing it. But this is the monster lineup. A lot of utility ones here, right? This wasn't a staple. This package wasn't a staple. These are the ones that were staples. Some people actually just kind of maxed out three, three Kaikus and a Jaug and kept it really simple. Maybe we'll eventually talk about those versions, but this is reminiscent of what I ran at Nationals that year. In terms of the spells, that obviously is the bread and butter of this deck. There's like 24 of them. So three... Star Hall. So this wasn't staple, but but basically what it does is every time a spell book is activated, which counts for your opponents, which makes the mirror match just ridiculous, it adds a counter to it, and then it increases the attack of your spellcasters by 100 points for every counter on it. And honestly, in the mirror match, sometimes if you have two or three of these going and both players are activating six or seven spell books a turn, you could literally get 15 counters on this, no problem. I remember playing a mirror match against Jesse Cotton at the end of day one in the mirror match, and that's actually exactly what happened. We both played this version, and this isn't a staple card in this deck, might I add. So not every version played this, but I really liked it in the mirror match because it made it really awkward for your opponent to go off into this because it could increase the attack of your spellbooks by such a ridiculous amount that even though both players are resolving Spellbook of Judgment, one player has that just huge superiority in terms of attack strength. It has another effect too. If it's destroyed with a counter, you can search your deck for a spellcaster that has a, a lower level to the number of counters on it. That not super likely. You can technically trigger it yourself with Heavy Storm, so it's not impossible that something like that happens, and your opponent can honestly heavy you. It's one of the reasons why playing Heavy Storm against this deck, usually something you want to do because it gives you a chance at clearing Jaugen, but you could be triggering Star Halls. It's one of the reasons why having a card like Prophecy in your deck, High Priestess rather specifically, is okay because it does give you a backup plan if this was killed with a lot of counters, but that doesn't actually happen all that often. Anyway, three Star Hall. I play three copies of Crescent. So Crescent is really just a turn one starter. That's really all it does. It can only be activated if you don't have a spell book in your graveyard, which means it's completely dead after turn one. But it enables you to search your deck for three spell, spell book cards, randomly get one to your hand, and it increases the likelihood of getting spell book of secrets on the first turn. And although it's dead going forward in the game, it's so critical to get Spellbook of Secrets and Spellbook of Judgment to resolve on the first turn, because if you do that going first, it's really hard to lose, particularly if you get one of those six or seven spell turns, and then you end up just searching all the good spell books. you set up your board, you get Jaugen or Kaiku, you get all the set cards, it's just really fantastic. So it's really important to see that on turn one, and having three copies of this with the three copies of Spellbook of Secrets and the three blue boys makes it so that you're more likely going to see that than not. So it's really, really important. You know, other decks had cards like Magical Malice to try and get into that engine, or honestly, even in some cases, Upstart Goblin. You can't activate a non-spellbook spell to try and activate this, so those two do conflict. So you might think, well, spellbooks, particularly Spellbook of Judgment with something like Tune Table of Contents or Upstart Goblin makes a lot of sense. Well, if you play this card, you can't really play those cards, so you end up really only getting to pick one, and for my, this version, I ended up playing three spellbook of the Crescent. And then, of course, three spellbook secrets. That's really self-explanatory. And then, really, the, the the reason this deck, in my opinion, is the best deck in the format, Spellbook of Judgment, that's a pretty controversial statement. A lot of people felt like Dragon Rules were better, but I really liked this deck. The fact that you could just tutor any card in the entire deck, basically, any Spellbook cards. Obviously, there's a couple one-ofs like Book of Moon and Heavy Storm in this particular version that I'm going to talk about, and it's not like you can tutor actual Solemn Judgment, some of the traps in this deck. But in terms of the entire engine, you could get any part of it whenever you needed, every single turn, to a large degree, and this deck had a lot of cool little tricks to it, and this card is just really the card that put it all together. If you never played with this card, it was really a ridiculous time to play, because every time you activate a spell to turn you activate this, 
During the end phase, you get to search your deck for a spellbook of a different name, and then you get to special summon a spell caster from your deck equal to the num equal or less than the number of spells that you ended up playing. So basically, you end up trying to activate as many spells as possible, and then during the end phase, you search for four, five, six different spellbooks, and you get to summon Jaugen, Defender, Justice of Prophecy, or Kaiku from the grit from the deck. And because so many of the cards in this deck are designed to protect monsters, whether that's Spellbook of Fate, some of the traps that I'm going to talk about, Spellbook of Wisdom, it can be really difficult to break your board, and then you just do the whole thing again, right? This card was at three, it was easy to search. It's a spellbook, so you can search it through Secrets, you can search it through Blue Boy, super, super easy. You can search it with Justice Prophecy in the end phase. And it's actually a quick play, so you could theoretically set this in the mirror match if you had multiple copies and activate it, and then it actually kind of puts your opponent in a little bit of a bind too, because now they're going to get to do that during the end phase on, of your turn as well. So it's just a really crazy card. It is really what made this deck so potent. The deck was playable after this card was banned, but there was nothing like Spellbook of Judgment Prophecies, really. It was just at such a ridiculous level of power. Other cards to support. So Spellbook of Fate was just super important because, yes, a lot of these are Rotas for Rota, right? This is Rota, this is Rota, this is just a ridiculously powerful Rota. Blue Boy is a Rota. The whole deck is just a bunch of Rotas. This is the card that actually enabled you to do something with all those because it enabled you to usually banish, but though it can sometimes set and bounce back rows, typically the banish effect is so cri critical. And... A lot of times what ended up happening with this deck is you would end phase, search so many spell books that you would actually want to activate some of them in the end phase because this triggers in the end phase. So you don't actually just get to set them all. It's not like you search five spell books and set them, which would be crazy. Not that searching them to your hand is, is all that much worse, but you would typically search a copy of this because you would activate this during the end phase to get rid of one of your opponent's cards or maybe set one of the cards in your field, right? You'd want to get a little bit of advantage in the end phase. So that was really valuable, really, really valuable to be able to do that. You add two copies of Tower, right? Tower is just one of those every single turn you get to draw a card engines. It also technically has another effect when it's destroyed. You can search your deck for a spellcaster based on the number of spell books in your graveyard. And sometimes that happened, right? If you have cards like Kaiku and you have cards like Jaugen in your deck and Defender, there are ways of getting multiple special summons off to really establish that lock of something like Jaugen plus Defender. So a couple copies of Tower and then a couple copies of Wisdom. So Wisdom basically lets you pick either mad or Spell or Trap and then protect a Spellcaster from that for the turn. This format had cards like, obviously, the Mirror Match, the Spellbook of Fate that you had to worry about. In other matchups, you had cards like, honestly, the Mirror Match too, because you're going to see it. I have them in my deck. Wing Blast was actually pretty popular this format because it did a pretty good job outing a lot of the difficult cards this format. So being able to call Trap is really great. So it had a lot of utility there. It was a quick play, so it is a card that you can activate in your opponent's turn too, which is really valuable. Some of these, quite a few of them are normal spells, right? These are normal spells, these are normal spells, these are continuous, obviously field spells, but having some spell books like this that can be used on your opponent's turn for protection purposes in ways of protecting Jalgen are great, and it also helps you protect from things like Book of Moon, right? You want to be able to protect Jalgen from even being set face down, which is really important because if that ever happens, your opponent can suddenly use all their, for example, Dragon Rulers and kill you, right? This deck is, in many ways... That word floodgate is a really, really great encapsulation of what Jaugen would do because the second they kill Jaugen, he usually just lost. If you actually go back and watch the World Championship Finals, that's actually exactly what happened. So having a card like Spellbook of Wisdom is fantastic because it enables you to do that. It also lets you use Priestess to special summon it, kind of play through back rows, some of the format. Things like Evil Swarms, for example, actually had a lot of traps in their deck, so it would allow you to do that too. Then we had a TCD exclusive, Spellbook of the Master. This enables you to basically copy a, a normal spellbook effect twice in one turn. It's really great because it enables you to do, for example, double power, even though you only run one copy. It basically is a free spellbook in, in your iteration of spellbooks over the course of the turn, right? So if you go book and you search blue boy, and you summon blue boy, and you search spellbook of judgment, and you play judgment, and then you activate master and you copy spellbook of secrets and now all of a sudden you get to search another spellbook it basically always adds one spellbook activation along the chain of events and enables you to double up on spellbooks that you might only play one copy i only have one copy of spellbook of power here for example although some of these versions play two that didn't often happen until spellbook of judgment was banned i think only one copy was really necessary in this particular format this is a card to tutor when you needed it and you could always double it up with spellbook of the master anyway but one copy of spellbook of the master one copy of eternity Trinity lets you get back the Rebanish spellbooks, which if you're using this card effectively, oftentimes you're banishing one with one and then bringing it back off Eternity or putting it back to the bottom of the deck with Spellbook of Tower. You basically never run out of Fate, which is really important. Even when this card was limited to one, you would really try and make sure you never ran out of it. 
But at this time, it's a three. We're electing only to play two. Spellbook of Eternity gives us that utility base to just make sure if we ever did need to banish it that we always got it back and always have one in rotation. Because as I mentioned, in a perfect world, you're setting one and using one during the end phase just so you get maximum value on both turns with this card. And then some non-spellbook cards, right? Because we're running Crescent, I, I kind of like to minimize this. I like Book of Moon just because it is a way of resetting your Blue Boy if that ever came up. It's just a pretty powerful card in this format. And then Heavy Storm. Heavy Storm wasn't stable, but I think it was valuable enough. I do think you want Heavy Storm because you can actually trigger some of your own effects with it, which is pretty cool. And then in addition to that, even Dragon Ruler sets a lot, right? If you can kill Wing Blast prematurely and then get Jalgen on the field, I think that's really valuable. So I think having a card like Heavy Storm is totally reasonable. And it's, it's only a one-off, right? I think it's totally reasonable. Uh, this deck can actually get to cards like Heavy Storm quicker than you might anticipate because if you judgment and just slim your deck for two turns all of a sudden your deck is really small and then you can end up drawing into some of those one ups in terms of the trap lineup all right so a lot of these decks played wing blast it is just a generically good card it allows you to discard dead spell books for example crescent as i mentioned is basically always dead after turn one so it gives you a discard it gives you an out to ophion ophion those of you who are unaware, can be a little bit of a frustrating card to play against because it's Topsy for Incessional Summoning Big Monsters when it has XYZ material, which it basically always does. I've elected to play Priestess. Suddenly makes me vulnerable to Ophion in the Evil Swarm matchup, so it gives me an out there. And in addition to that, it just gives you a generic removal piece against a lot of things, right? Draco Sack can be a little bit annoying to deal with. And other... Other creatures of that nature. I almost thought to myself, am I going to call it Draco back? I've been in a moment there, just caught myself. Did I call it Draco? No, Draco sick. I called it correctly. You can deal with that. It can deal with a lot of difficult cards. It's just a fantastic trap card, chainable, obviously. This deck always has just a ton of cards in hand, and it's a really great way. It's a chainable way of protecting Jaogun, right? That's all you really want, a chainable way to protect Jaogun. Virtually all these decks played each of the Solemns, which I think are fantastic. You want Solemn Judgment just because you want to protect Jaogun at all costs. It also works really well with the side deck. This is a fantastic way of dealing with XYZ monsters like Draco back if, or Draco Sack if your opponent summons it. The other card, and I legitimately played this at Nationals, Kevin Keener actually played this, I think I said his name correctly, but the person that got second at World actually main decked these at World, which is pretty cool because I was legitimately main decking two copies of Curse Seal at Nationals that year for the mirror match. It's actually good in other matchups too, right? If your opponent in games two and three in the Dragon Ruler matchup put in cards like MST, you can actually just kill all your opponent's MSTs with this, which is something that I did. You might see this and think, wow, that's dead against Dragon Rules, but it's really not. I mean, it hits Super Rejuvenation, hits a lot of their power cards. And I, again, I actually kept this in against them in games two and three because I wanted to stop some of the back row removal, particularly MST. And if you hit one MST, you hit all of them. This card, though, primarily was for the mirror match, right? If you hit your opponent's Spellbook of Judgment or even Secrets, quite frankly, it can be really difficult for your opponent to kill you because you're negating it, you're stopping your opponent from activating for the rest of the game, maybe they have more dead copies, and if you're playing the mirror match and you can Spellbook of Judgments, but your opponent can't, your opponent's playing the old school version of Spellbooks versus the absolutely ridiculous version, and your opponent's just going to lose. So this card was just incredible, incredible in the mirror match, and was actually pretty good in other matchups as well. So I did actually play two copies, which is hilarious. My national story that year, as I mentioned in the intro, is pretty funny. I went 6-0 against Dragon Rulers, 0-1 against Evil Swarms, so I lost both of the mirror matches, even though I was playing this card. So that's my main deck. For the extra deck, the extra deck is not overwhelmingly important. Shining Angel was important because it was a spellcaster rank two. It could basically upgrade your blue boys. Gotcha, gotcha, gave you a defensive outlet. Sometimes you could win the game out of nowhere with Augusto Phoenix. It wasn't super overwhelmingly likely, but I mean, it was possible, right? You do play level twos in your deck. Uh, Zen Mai, Meister is a way of reflipping your blue boy, right? If you have two Kaiki... <laughs> Like, this is really going to happen. You have two Kaikus and a Blue Boy. You can technically go into this and then flip the Blue Boy up and down and get the effect during the end phase and then maybe search Fate and banish something during the end phase. It's not impossible, so it gave you something there. Cowboy, just for burn damage, if you ever get the two level fours in the field. Same thing with Black Ship of Corn, Utopia, and Utopia Ray, just giving you a win condition. Sometimes could pull that off. If you ever get three level fours in a mirror match, which is basically never going to happen, you could go into Shockmaster, call spells, or honestly, maybe even traps. Uh, this Dweller could technically be valuable. Not that I think you'd ever really want to get rid of two Kaikus against Dragon Ruler, but I don't know, maybe you're afraid your opponent can kill the Kaiku, so you want to preemptively just detach off Dweller. Uh, there's Maestro, there's Diamond Direwolf, some generic removal, and then some level 7s. Because I play Prophecy, I'm going to put basically the three possible rank 7s that you could go into. Obviously, Draco Sack, Prophecy, and Big Eye. You very rarely went into any of these, right? 
very, very rarely. Maybe this in the mirror match could theoretically ever come up or even against Evil Swarms, but it's just so unlikely you would ever want to do that. The, the, the threes, the, the level two guys came up every now and again. These basically never came up. Because I don't play Veiler anywhere, and I don't play any tuner, I've elected just not to play any synchro monsters, which would otherwise fill up the extra deck. All right, so what are we worried about against this format? So we have the mirror match, obviously. That's a huge concern. The mirror match, that's why I'm main in Curse Seal. We have Dragon Rulers, and we're not talking the Dragon Ruler versions that existed in the year that followed. We're talking about full power, full three baby, if you want, and most versions play two, but babies, three big ones, the babies, the whole, whole deck with super rejuvenation at its full, full, full power. So we actually have to worry about that deck. And then Evil Swarms, and honestly, that's it. Maybe, let's say, 5% of the field might play something like Mermills, and then everything else you're just never going to play against. I didn't play against anything else at Nationals but these three decks. Virtually every deck that topped was these three decks, and Fire Fists, not a real deck to me at this time, Mermills, all those decks were just completely outclassed by Spellbooks and by Dragon Rulers. So these are the only ones I care about. All right, first we have three copies of Maxi, which I thought was pretty good against... Dragon Rulers, right? Obviously, it's just good against Dragon Rulers, but your opponent, if they open EEV, will special summon as many monsters as possible to make it live. And because of the way the side deck is constructed, you can actually play through EEV relatively easily, which is one of the reasons I love this deck. The only time I ever lost to EEV at Nationals is if I got hit game one, which is actually how I lost to Evil Swarms. But besides that, against Dragon Rulers, they'd hit you with it, and you can actually still beat them with the side deck. So I think Maxi is really important because it gives you two or three sometimes even more draws as your opponent establishes that big dark monster. And then that allows you to draw into some of the trap cards that I have on the side deck here and just beat your opponent even if they resolve what they think is the game-breaking card. A couple copies of MST, just some generic removal. Obviously, these are the big three decks. Evil Swarms is the deck that you worry about the most, but this is actually pretty good against some other things, right? You can actually make things like the Spellbook Tower mistiming. You chain this to the Spellbook Tower effect to put it at the bottom and it kills it, and then you just don't get to search for the Spellbook. Uh, spellcaster monster so we had some utility there i think it's a generically useful card right with heavy storm in the main deck and wing blast you have some removal but having a little bit more is not too bad then we have three copies of mind drain this was my favorite card against dragon Rilla. so basically you pay a thousand just like all the other drain cards and cards in the hand can't activate why that's so ridiculous is it stops all the baby effects and it stops all the dragon rulers sort of i guess their secondary effects right blaster can't be discarded to pop something which is just huge right your opponent trying to think about ways to get rid of Jaugen, well, that completely shuts them down. And I remember several games at Nationals where I would establish Kaiku plus this, so they can't summon guys from the graveyard, they can't summon guys from the hand, and they can't do anything. They just lose the game, and I haven't activated any spell cards. It's actually pretty ridiculous, which is why I also cited three copies of Dark Bribe, right? So now when we combine Dark Bribe with the Curse Seal in the main deck, you can start to see what the side deck pattern looks like in, against Dragon or Lish, where your opponent thinks that it's going to outright kill you with Eradicator, calling spells, where honestly, maybe even calling traps would be better because I'm going to have Solemn Judgment, three Dark Bribes, two Curse Seals to protect my Floodgates, slash my Jaugen and the Kaiku and the other monsters, and I'm going to make it really difficult for you to kill me. Really, really difficult. Against Evil Storms, I have three copies of Royal Decree, right? If you get to the side of games against that deck, you definitely want Royal Decree. The deck has literally 15 plus trap cards. It was sort of just the remaining remnants of a trap heavy deck. And the only reason this deck was any good was because of Ophion. But having cards like Royal Decree are really good because your deck's all spell cards. Yeah, you don't have to play with any of the traps. And the last card is another copy of Curseal. I think Curseal was just so good in the mirror match when you got it to resolve. So having three copies, I think, was just critical. Absolutely, absolutely critical. But when I played against Dragon Rulers, right, the sort of the boogeyman in the room, and you're side decking in all of these cards, right, all nine of these cards, that's a huge, huge strategy against them that they might not necessarily anticipate, right, where they're expecting you to just have your typical just typical spellbook deck, and all of a sudden you're beating them with trap cards. I remember one game very, very vividly, I'll never forget this game, where my opponent invests a lot into getting EEV plus Big Eye, which is typically the level 7 XYZ monster that they can go into, so they invest a lot of things, right? They discard a bunch of these, they do a bunch of that, and then my hand, when he EEVs it, is literally Solemn Judgment, Dark Bribe, Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer, Mind Drain, and maybe two spells, right? And it didn't really matter that he knocked the spells. Guys like, summon Kaiku, attack, banish your guys, or I don't even think you banish them because they did search, but you attack, set my trap cards, go, and then he looks at his hand and is like, well, I can't summon them from the graveyard, I can't summon them from my hand, I can't use my hand effects, and you've got counter traps. Like, all right, I guess you just win, which is exactly what happened. So it gave you a really viable game to win condition, which is why I just loved this nine card package, right? Your opponent goes off a little bit, so you get a bunch of cards in your hand, you draw into these, plus the traps you're already playing. EEV doesn't matter. But nevertheless, that's Joe Lander for Yu-Gi-Oh! History. 
Thank you for watching. Check back soon for plenty more Yu-Gi-Oh! content.